All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to B-Size Las Vegas. Uh, this talk is going to be about cyber risk. How does cyber events uh, become so costly? Um, I'm sorry, how do you say name? Wendy Honeely. Wendy Honeely is going to be our speaker today. Um, before we begin, though, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event. They're the ones that make this possible. Uh, Adobe is going to be our gold sponsor, or is going to be our diamond sponsor, and our gold sponsors are Prisma Cloud, uh, Sem Group, and Blue Cat. Uh, it's their support that's allow that allows us to put on these events uh, today. And um, for uh, cell phones, if you have a cell phone, um, please put it on silence. Um, and you know. For um, respect towards the speaker, if you can, uh, if we can minimize any type of interaction or conversations, um, if you have questions at the end or if there's time for questions, uh, there will be a there will be a period for that. I'll be walking around with a mic, so if you just want to raise your hand, I'll come to you, and then we'll uh, we'll just use the microphone, and then you can ask questions to the speaker. Um, uh, and that's that's all. So uh, with, without further ado, um, yeah, I'll be going to shut this off. Good morning. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm excited for this talk just because, you know, we had a lot of people really didn't understand or wanting to know what it looked like when it has a cyber event. So I would click there. I'm still testing my stuff. <laughs> so I'll start the agenda today. It was going to be, I started with some uh, trends and statistics, and then I go through some of the major category of cyber events and talk about each one of those type of event, what are the cost components of those events. And I added the last bullet uh, because um, I don't want to tell you how bad it is without telling you how do you make it better, sort of. So that was the last thing that I added. So there's a few slides on that one to, um, to give you some information of things that you minimally have to have. Otherwise, they won't even sell you cyber insurance. So, uh, so intro. Um, I'm from uh, Marsh McLennan. Uh, we're one of we are the biggest insurance broker in the world. Uh, Seventy percent of the global two thousand actually buy their insurance through us. Um, uh, so you think of all the big names as well as a lot of the smaller. We also have to cover small insurance uh, comp smaller companies as well and as well as reinsurers. So we also have a company that also does uh, reinsurers for the different insurance portfolio, and we consult on that one as well. So um, we get a lot of different sort of data in a sense. So speaking of data, here's some of the data source I'm gonna use for today's presentation. Um, Sidewave, it's, uh, it used to be Avizen, there's a loss fee data that's in there. Uh, there's Flashpoint, which is used to be risk-based security. Uh, they have a vulnerability database and a breach uh, incident database that they have. Um, also publicly reported, so any of the data that such as from financial companies, from 10Ks, from their press release, uh, usually when the breach is big enough, they have to report it. So that's where they, we got some of those numbers from. Uh, so those are the public data source I'll be using, and the private data source, proprietary data source, would be the claims. So the Marsh McLennan claims, as well as uh, we have UKs and uh, Europeans, and as well as the different insurance portfolio claims. So the reinsurers, when they have different insurance portfolios, when those portfolio make claims, it actually gets into our database. Um, most of the data I use is ranging from 2017 to 2023, except uh, some of the privacy claim stuff that's go further back just because those claims takes a long time to settle. Um, if you look at some of the big claims last few years, uh, many of those are still open uh, just because um, since 2019, there are still claims from 2019 that's open. There are still many claims that's still on the privacy claims is still open. So I'll go through the trends and statistics. And this one, um, it's from the 2017 to 2023. Um, as you can see, my data, either both actually, the data is a little bit biased toward the US. However, it does have um, the, the incident rate in general in the US is also higher. 
So there's two kind of biases. So this is about 84,000 incidents uh, from 2017 to 2023. And uh, the 2022 and 2023 is partial data just because um, there's discovery delays, there's reporting de delays, there's storage to the database delays. So if you look at it, there is delays on those. Um, if you look at just the US, since this is the one that representing a lot of the data, uh, you can see that it increasing from 2019 to 2020 when COVID happened, uh, that really jumped up in terms of frequencies. And then 2021, it come down a bit. And then uh, 2022, it's not all done yet. I think there's still things that being reported, uh, but it hadn't quite make it to the database. I think the average dwell time when the bad actors in your in the environment Today, according to Mandian, it's 16 days. But then, you know, if you look at the Marriott incident, and it was, it got into the environment in 2014, and they didn't find it till 2018. So it could be a long time before you actually discover it. And then as some of those things, it will see those kind of stuff, it will happen. So uh, 2022 and 2023. And you, if you look at evol evolution of time, um, you can see that, for example, uh, healthcare on the bottom here, it's pretty much a big uh, band, big percentage of the events, uh, along with financials and public administrations. However, if you look at manufacturer, which is this guy, uh, you can see that at first there was not much of it, and then until 2020, it's starting to getting more and more and now the ransomware event is hitting that as well. So um, you can see the different industry evolutions of those different industries through time and see how they change. Um, so now I'm gonna go through the privacy breach event. The lawyer took out all my names. <laughs> <laughs> so I can only put country on there. <laughs> But you can tell th this is all public data. This is nothing private data. This is not proprietary data. So I wasn't going to show that, but I had company names here. But they said, no, take it up, just because some of those are our clients. So got yanked off. But if you can actually go look up, if you look up those kind of numbers, the, the millions and the dates, you'll find them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see some of those privacy breaches very huge. You probably knew what this one is. The first one, and uh, it's almost a billion dollar in fine just on that one, easily. And all fifty some states all reach out for the state attorney general will all came and asked for fines and penalties on that one. FTC fines, this long list of fines that hit that damage to be worth a couple billion dollars of damages. Yes. By privacy, do you mean PII data? PII, PHI, and PCI. So PII would be the names and social securities, those type of data. And PHI would be healthcare records, those type of data. And PCI would be the credit cards and any source of financial information, account numbers and so forth, those, those kind of data. That would be, that's what I call privacy. Good call out, thank you. So, yep. But I can get in way with the fines. <laughs> Now, those are the different fines that was due to the privacy. Well, actually, a settle, settlement fines and penalties. And so those are the huge one that you can see uh, various industries actually are represented here. And when they have uh, fines, those are not small fines. Um, some of those are GDPR fines, um, but um, people under the impression saying that they're the this could be a, actually this when I do the model, I built model for Marsh and for the last six years. And this is one of the big components actually um, comes into the get into the very big severe penalties um, of fines. So um, this is the fines and penalties of for the different companies. And if you talk about GDPR fines, that somebody say, oh, we're not doing business in Europe. But if a European citizen come to the U.S. for your company, did a haircut, and you lost their data, 
you could subject to GDPR fines. And that's 4% of your revenue or $20 million. So, and then if you look at the GDPR fine itself, majority of the fine in there is not due to a cyber incident, but due to process compliance, how you keep your data and stuff. And so anybody could be hit for that. And similarly, I think you, Kathy, you and I had a conversation about you know, all the different states. If different states, California citizens go to Texas to do, buy something and you lost their credit card number or something, you can also uh, subject to that state's fine as well. So this is a big category. So um, just the model that I, when we built Privacy Breach, um, here's a typical claim expense that comes with, within that model. So uh, PR and pri crisis management, the breach council. So just because you didn't lose the data, but if anybody just touched your data, you're gonna need to have to go have a conversation uh, with the lawyer to see what you need to do to be compliant. So that's the breach counsel, general legal counsel, PR, and some some of the big one. If you lost a lot of them, then you probably have to set up a call center just because people is going to ask questions. Uh, investigation, forensics, notifications, and you see legal right there. And there's various identity theft protection services that could become a pretty big bill. And of course. Uh, the data restoration, that one is a tough one. That one um, also could be um, a software. You have to need software to rebuild the system. Uh, you have engineering services, consultants, and so forth. And then not to mention regulatory fines, legal causes, and liabilities, and settlements, and stuff like that. So I think on a previous slide, if you look at the fine, right, some of this stuff, it's um, it's pretty huge, and I think there's some of them that's not even finished yet, like this one. Um, it's $90, $80 million fine and 190 settlements, and there's still uh, additional settlements coming along as well. So, and in addition, for technology companies, if you provide any sorts of te technology services, and uh, as well as products that could comprised of appliances, equipment, and stuff like that. Uh, if you lost people's information, you can also subject to tech e and errors and omission type of uh, insurance. So um, that could turn out to be very big. So those are usually third-party consequential losses as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that one on the next. So everybody says, what cyber, well, you know, all this stuff. What does cyber insurance actually is? So this is a, my summary slide. So any first party stuff, anything that you investigate the, uh, the uh, cyber extortions, ransomware, uh, business interruptions. A lot of people doesn't even know their policy actually have business interruption coverage. So, um, and then as well as any sorts of restoration of data, response, legal, all of those are as part of the insurance. And usually, um, I think I forgot which words I got the source. It was like if uh, when a company actually go buy cyber insurance, the chances that they get uh, hacked is less. And when they get hacked, the severity is also less because the insurance company actually does require them to have a lot of those planned ahead of time before they'll insure them. So, which is why the severity and frequency tend to be a bit less. And then any sort of third party liabilities, that, uh, lawsuits and stuff like that, uh, privacy liabilities and network security liability, regulatory. Some of those depend on the states and countries. Some of those will not pay for the fines. Others countries will pay for the fines. Could be covered by insurance, but that depends on your policy. But what does not cover is any sorts of intangible assets, copyrights, trade secrets, any of those customer lists, those will not be covered. So if you lost it, you lost it. That's not going to be insurable. So there is overlaps between cyber insurance liability that arise due to the insurer's operating 
risk. And then there's the, tech, you know, any sort of liability because of your actual product. If you, they could say, you know, you could have done better, your stuff embedded the issues in here that um, um, caused us damages. If you lost my customer, like if you're a cloud service provider, if you lost somebody's customer names and stuff, a list, customer list, uh, you could be subject for, to tech e &O as well. So here's one of those graphs that I did for building the model. <laughs> uh, different industry, as you can see, frequencies also different, but as the revenue increases, the number of incidents also increases along the way. So uh, um, we can see that the larger company tend to, it makes sense. And that's, uh, you know, larger company has, tend to have more events than the smaller guys. Also too, there might be something about it, it's that um, maybe some of the small guys didn't even report it. So that could be also part of that. Uh, <laughs> so this is a per record cost for larger, large privacy breach. You can see the range anywhere from less than a dollar, 36 cents or 20 cents if you were to count the high end of the range on Yahoo to over $500 per record. And those are still pretty big numbers. And some of those are still open. And so um, this is like the number of record they lost. And then this is uh, what they disclosed. It's publicly disclosed only, which means there's a whole chunk of it. It's probably still never talked about, never reported. So that's, that's not in this number. So per record cost will be higher actually, most likely. Well, it is higher, it will be higher because a lot of those they don't disclose. And uh, some of those number we got it off of their press release some of those numbers we got off their 10Ks. Some of those comes off their annual financial data and stuff like that. So, and <laughs> we also, when we're looking at those things, sometimes they kind of uh, iffy about disclosing those. So like one of the company got ransomed, they said, okay, we had hacked by ransom. Um, we pay ransom. However, uh, along with the flood in Texas, we, the whole loss is $140 million. <laughs> So they don't tell you exactly what they lost. So why did data breach become so costly? For the smaller breaches, forensic and breach, breach response. You know, when you had a breach, that's what you have to have. And then for the larger one, the cost coming from the vendor expense, the legals and the fines and penalties and settlements and liabilities and so forth. Those were the buckets. So when we model it, we model for smaller companies and there, there are certain frequency for small breaches and there are certain frequency for large breaches. When large breaches happen, then a lot of those uh, fines and penalties and settlement get kicks in and that's how we built the model to say, this is what your risks look like. Um, I want to also next thing to move on is talk about business interruption. Um, so this was not in too many people's radar until I think 2016 there was a botnet that basically shut down the east coast of the internet is this Mara botnet and then the not Petcha happened, that's 2017. And then that's when everybody said, ooh, we need to buy uh, BI insurance, business, business interruption insurance. Today, it's actually gonna become bigger and worse than it, was, it would be because a lot of our um, companies, the, they're so integrated in terms of supply chains. So remember COVID when the chip shortage happened and they can't produce as many cars, they can't deliver cars? Well, this is what happened when you have business interruptions. There are liabilities and, and um, Oftentimes, a lot of those events doesn't even get reported just because they're, they're small and they just won't tell anybody about it. So here's not Petcha that um, names got erased, <laughs> become countries, but you know who they are, exactly. Um, so the worst one, it's uh, $1.4 billion worth of damages on not Petcha. And then uh, 
that one actually not only hit they maxed out the cyber policies and they also went uh, went to the property policies. So then there's a discussion of that's act of war, war, W A R, and if it's war we don't cover it. And then so there's lawsuits and lawsuits. Eventually they won and say that is part of not war. That is part of the property stuff. So certain part of that did get covered. So. And some of the other large business interruption loss, um, you can see uh, those are pretty recent, except I think I don't have any 2022 there. There's the 2022 one didn't make the list, but some of those actually made a list. However, they blended themselves with other losses, so I couldn't <laughs> put it on the list. <laughs> So yeah, so this is some of those large ones, but all of this is public. You can actually go search for it. That's the company, that, that's the countries that they're from. And uh, you'll find it if you search for specific numbers on the lost damages and the false timeline, you can probably find the company if you want it to really know. But this is just give you an idea what kind of impact a business interruption loss could have. It's huge. Um, so the way, we compute some of the, the different losses in the business interruption is that you have you shut down time, you have time that you actually down for a period of time, and you slowly recover, and then there's a period of restoration. Now this back end here could be really long. We had customers, we have clients that actually, after two years, they're still suffering losses because their process, either their blueprints got lost. So now instead of build, building a factory, building a, some sort of power plant by module, they have to recreate all those modules. And uh, there are some of those were pharmaceuticals. The tests that they have, the, the data that they test, they have to be certain uh, uh, FDA compliance. While those data is lost, start all over again. So, yeah, so th those are, could be really damages. And by the way, the revenue itself is not insurable, but the income loss is insurable. So any of those things like, you know, if you pay salary during those times, you pay rent for the buildings, those kind of things during those times, it is insurable. So, you know, a lot of people doesn't really, some of the company doesn't understand that is valuable as well, because anytime when you have a big ransomware, a big BI event, this is actually a big component that could be covered by insurance. Um, I look at by industry over there, and the biggest one was education and public administration, healthcare, and uh, some finance and insurance, and then CMT, communication, media, technology, those are the kind of frequencies of where by industry last few years, that's what they're being hit the most. Um, so why do business disruption events so expensive? Well, you have revenue loss, you can have unfulfilled orders, you have loss, loss orders, uh, you could have a long tail recovery time due to physical or intellectual property damages. Uh, you could uh, have just higher cost of production. We have a lot of clients that just because they had something happen to them, now their production is a lot higher. Uh, there's contingent BI, so BI that other are depending on you to run their business or build their products that you could be liable for. And of course, it's legal and liabilities. So those are the kind of things that would be and I think this is one that everybody been asking about lately is ransomware. So I'll go through ransomware. So the data set I have of ransomware is about 11,200 ransomware event from 2017 to 2023. Um, I picked 2017 and actually 2017 to 2018 was not so bad because um, a lot of those, I actually did a time series analysis on that one. There's clearly a break point between 2018 and 2019. And if you run the time series, it's gonna go right there. There's a very clear break point on that. Um, I only counted the event that's 
so intent to extract ransoms. I didn't count the not petja because not petja is not a ransom extracting event. They said three hundred dollar event you pay, they're destroying your um, infrastructure. So they're not wanting to collect the three hundred dollar, and they don't have key to fix it. So I didn't count that. So that's where that is. And here are some of the large ransomware losses, and it's few hundred millions. And uh, I think there's some. It's all in the millions. So I think the last one that made it to the list is about fifteen million dollar. But still, that is a pretty big damages in terms of ransomware. Um, again, those are all publics. So in terms of ransomware, here's the list of things. You got to pay the ransom or negotiate the ransom. The average ransom negotiation time, that's about five days. So it takes you about five days to actually, just on average, get negotiated if you decide that you want to pay or not pay. And then you have to have OFAC uh, certification. So in all the sanctioned country, if the ransom organizations from sanctioned country, you can't even pay the ransom. And in order, if you do, then, uh, then you get in trouble with the U.S. government. Um, there's, uh, on the bad uh, ransomware event, business interruption would be a big one. So if you don't have your uh, backups and stuff like that, that it could be a, a, a huge cost as well. And if any of the record was held for ransom, then there could be crisis management type and stuff. And of course, investigations and as well as privacy related product. And um, that's all in, in the list of, in terms of ransoms. And then, of course, then you have your regulator regulatory stuff. If you lost a lot of record, and that could be pretty large settlements there. And then I put the extra expense. This was actually from one of our claims. <laughs> Here's a list of all the extra expense that goes with it. And uh, temporary worker, temporary data center, temporary cloud services, uh, any sorts of incremental to financial statements, audit fees, incremental internal labor costs, employee expense, pizza <laughs> for the Friday night. <laughs> uh, or you make it well, goodwill stuff. And I think that's a big one in Japan. There's a apology fees that you have to pay as well, too. So I'm told I better go faster. <laughs> so um, here's the frequency of ransomware. You can see that 2017, 2018, 2018 is pretty much none, and then 2019 is starting to go up. And then when uh, COVID happened, whee, exponentially gone up, and Russian-Ukraine war sanctioned, it went down. And because they couldn't get hardware to, and to get the money, and here's the latest, most active ransomware group that we have on our list. So I thought I'd put it up there. That was the last thing as well. Um, 2022 and 2023 is also, uh, 2022 is also data is still partial as well. So, yeah, you can see it's coming back up again after the sanction. So they figure out the way to get hardware to actually do the ransom activity. They figure out to get the money because for a while that because of sanction they couldn't get the money. Um, and then look at the different industries. Uh, at first it was the uh, the the, um, you can help, see healthcare initially really got hit a lot. And then the, uh, the next one is manufacturer, which is the orange one. It's right here. At first, they weren't getting hit that much, but look at what happened to it now. It's a huge percentage of manufacturer. And then it goes up to educations. The orange guy is professional services. So the law firms, they're getting, they weren't getting hit much. Now they're getting all hit, different type of professional services type of organizations are now getting hit more and more so. Um, so this is one of the guys is like, well, when I get ransom, what do I do? <laughs> so this is like the percentage of the company who pay versus the percentage of not pay. So as you can see from 2017 on, there were a lot more that pay because people weren't as ready as it was prepared. So they may not have backup, they may not have the right stuff they were supposed to have. 
And um, now, as it caught up to 2021 and 2022, we are seeing a smaller percentage of company are paying as well. So, and here's the bridge response costs. Uh, I put this in percentile just because I didn't want to actually tell you how much they pay because there are clients. Um, the average, and so the blue chart is actually a log normal fit to the distribution of bridge response. Uh, uh, in terms of the green one, the median and average is actually um, actual number. That's why there are green bars there. But if you look at that, the average there is in what? 981k in terms of response costs, it's above the 80 percentile. So that means that there's some company or companies out there did spend a lot of money on bridge response costs in terms of that. And here's a uh, known total cost versus the average uh, total cost incurred. Um, so you can see that. Uh, there are a number of events out of those that has the little thing, this thing is right here, it's actually a number of events, but then each one of those bar is the total cost of the, the average cost in that. So 2017 was pretty high, 2018 it's not too bad, it gone down, but 2019 and 2022 it get, did get a lot higher. And then this is the known total cost per year that I could find of all the known total costs. Um, this is a chart of average ransom where demand and payment for our clients. So from 2019, in the beginning of time, they don't know what they're doing, so they just demand anything and everything. And look at the pay ranges, they, it's a lot smaller. Um, so we had companies that got like, they were only like, you know, Five million, I think it's eight million was their revenues, and the ransom demand was eighty million. <laughs> it was like we can't pay that. We don't even have anything to pay that. It was like mm, it's just not happening. So you can see beginning of it, it's really wide range just because they don't know what to ask. They don't care, just ask something. <laughs> but as it goes into 2022, you can see the range got a lot smaller. See, this is the demand range. This is the pay range of that. And so it did get a lot smaller. And by the way, the largest ransom demand in 2023 so far is $175 million. And the average pay, the actual, not that one, but largest pay is 30 million this year. So it's, it's a decent number, it's a huge number. Um, the most active ransomware group is Lockbit. So, yeah. And here's the ransom pay by, um, you know, by year, and see the different percentiles and stuff like that as well. So this was our clients. And you can see that uh, 2021 had uh, some of the bigger ransom amount that was pay. So, yeah. Um, so how is the cost distributed? So I took about 40 something, 50, somewhere around there uh, of the ransomware claims that has all the detailed costs and I was able to group and the one that didn't have detailed costs got tossed out. So when I separated them, um, here's what the distribution of that and you can look at it, ransom payment took almost about 30% but and the business interruption takes about 30%. And this is all from various industries didn't have. And the liability on this one is small just because it's a very, I think there's only like two maybe that had liabilities in there. So it doesn't really represent what the true cost is. And there's a claim preparations type of fee if when you get uh, had events, you gotta pay for claims. And you gotta prepare a claim to for the insurance that so there's the fee that consulting does charge. So that's what the restorations and distribution. So this is one of the things that people ask a lot is like, if I had a ransomware event, what do I do? How much is it gonna cost me? This is sort of an average thing. And we talked about move it, so I added this slide. <laughs> <laughs> 
So move it happened in June. So July, we start getting hit by claims. So up to date, we had about 117 claims as of yesterday. That's how many it's happening. And it's happened mostly to education, financial, healthcare, and communication. So yeah, that's what happened lately. So how did they become so costly? So far, uh, well, of course, you saw the cyber privacy business disruption ransomware. And I also want to call out technology errors and omissions. If you provide any sorts of services, uh, technology services as well as products, that could happen as well. Um, once they got in your environment, they could fraudulently reroute your funds and there's, it hit, could hit your crime policy. And then, um, we have ransom that hit multiple policies, hit the cyber policy, as well as their kidnap ransom, kidnap and ransom policy as well too. So when one policy ran out, depends on the wording, they could be paying for the other policies. And then we've certainly seen it hit a lot, hit the property policies as well too. So there's multiple damages across basically your whole enterprise on a different front and that could get very expensive. So how, so this is the part that I didn't put it on my original agenda, but I thought it would be fair to actually talk about how do you improve it with all this stuff. So I want to talk specifically some of the top controls that, has, that you have to have. So the data that I use was firmographic data from Dun & Bradstreet, um, any of the historical incident data that we talked about from RBS Advisons and uh, Marsh McClendon claims, uh, insurance claims, including the insurance portfolio claims, and then also any of those technographic data that we have inside and outside in assessments, as well as the uh, scoring of this side and security scorecard. Those are the outside looking in and see the different scores that you have. And so we've gone through the probability of success of the cyber events and look at industry specific implementation of those controls. Um, we also, let me see if that's on the next one. Yeah. So this is like when they come and get insurance, we make them fill a 150 or so questionnaire covering all this broad spectrum. And we call it cyber self-assessment. So it's sort of a, we make them go through all this stuff in terms of governance, account monitoring, business continuity, recovery, any sorts of stuff that we ask. So this is, this is just our, as a broker, we asked them to make out a field question. And what we do is we correlate those data and um, we correlate it with the firmographics as well. So there's firmographic data in terms of revenue bin, high versus low. High is anything billion and above, low is anything that's less than a billion. And as you can see, um, the company's firmographic matters. So if you, the conditional probability of a claim in the low is about 3%, 2.97, and the condition probability for a high revenue co company is about 8%. So it's more than double what it is. Um, so we also do that as well. And, um, and then um, we've gone through from the CSA that they had, we, uh, the cyber self-assessment, we compute the signal strength of those versus the claim data that we have in-house. So what we're saying is that, you know, secure configuration came out on top. You gotta have configuration management tools such as active directories and so forth. Uh, you gotta monitor your account. Those are some of the top controls that you have to have um, in order to reduce the frequency of your claim. Well, frequency of event, therefore claims. So, <laughs> so um, I, I, some of the stuff is because there's so many things that you have to look out for. So, what is the priority, right? So, so this is what we're saying that when we come to of those 150 questions that we have, this is what we came up would be the top things that you have to have. And then, in some of those cases, individually, some of those questions like this one uh, about multi multi factor authentication. If you just do one, it's 1.25 in terms of signal strength. 
But if you add the couple other two, then you actually get to a 1.44. So it, the completeness of those implementation matters as well. So it could be a huge impact. Um, we grouped the, uh, grouped the questions by control categories. And if that control category for multi-factor authentication is well implemented, then you, you, the likelihood of uh, good signal strengths increase quite a lot. So, and then we looked at the incident rates along the various companies and see how they are in terms of uh, in terms of in implementations, and education sort of came out low on the list, and then they uh, uh, of all the top controls, and they also have significantly higher claim rates compared to others as well. So failure to implementation top control is reflected in the industry incident rates. And here's the top five things. Without those positive, those are the top five you have to have. Without it, um, they don't want to sell you cyber insurance. And, or they can sell you cyber insurance with extremely high price. So that's the. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is based on study, actual data, fact data that we check from our customer answering. And we have a few thousand of those per year of those answers at least. And then back to the many years, as well as back to many years of, I think 10 years of claims. And that's what we came back to be to say, this is stuff that you must have in, go in order to reduce your frequency of your cyber events. So the key takeaway is that, you know, you use the self-assessment data to allow you to figure out what are the most impactful control, which is what I listed. And um, if you broad and robust adoption of some of those controls, it's necessary for their effectiveness. Multi-factor multi authentication was the example that I used. And then industry with lower implementation rate has high impact control tend to have higher cyber event rates. And here's where you can get more information about the priorities, as well as my email address on the bottom if you want a copy of the presentation. That's it.